honestly, I don't really like Valentine's Day an awful lot. I've never liked it that much. Why? Which part? So I think I think part of it was like when I was single, like it was partially jealousy, I think, where like I wanted to be in relationship and I wasn't. But on a more fundamental level, I just felt like it was really cheesy as well. And I just felt like it was kind of something that men felt obligated to do for their women. Um, And I still kind of feel that way because, let's see, I've been dating now for a little bit over a year. And I still feel about the same where, like, we don't really celebrate it. Yeah, I mean, I don't really, I I can't say that I completely get the point of it. It usually comes with seasonal candies that are horrible or just uh, heart-shaped. Yeah. Corporate cash grab might feel more or less likely. It's just, it's just another marketing. It's another season for them. Because like, what what, what do they do after New Year's and Christmas? Yeah, I mean, like the first thing they do. They're they're waiting till Easter. They got to have something, so. Right. That's what I'm saying is like, like literally when you walk into a grocery store, like maybe even like slightly before New Year's, you're already seeing Valentine's Day stuff. Oh yeah. It's just like Which, seeing it's just like seeing Christmas stuff come in on the tail end of Halloween <laughs> decorations right. as it's going out the door. You got Christmas lights coming in and they just completely skip over Thanksgiving. It's not a thing. Do they skip over? But I mean you really yeah, they did this year. At least oh at my, my local stores, I never, okay. I never saw Thanksgiving decorations. It was just Halloween to Christmas. Huh. Well, anyway, though, I walked into my local. Um, now, for people who are in the United, who are not in Charlotte or in North Carolina, this is going to sound like the stupidest store name on the planet. Um, but it's called a Harris Teeter, <laughs> and so I walked into. Oh no, um, Texas has Tom Thumb. True, true. Although we still have um, Piggly Wiggly. Well, we have Did you Piggly, know about those ones? We don't have Piggly Wiggly in North Carolina, though. We have it in South Carolina, right? Uh, I believe you can find Piggly Wiggly out by the, uh, the Outer Banks and stuff. Oh. South Carolina definitely has it. I love Piggly right. Wiggly. Piggly Wiggly is adorable. I can't get enough. It's a dumb name, though. <laughs> <laughs> it is dumb. I think I think the reason why I have a thing for Piggly Wiggly is because my dad talked about it when he was younger, and he talked about it with a great amount of joy because he lived in Texas, and that was the only place that had air conditioning. <laughs> so I always thought of it as like a fun place to go. Um, but... Well, oh, there's actually one out in Hickory. Are you serious? Mm-hmm. That's the closest wow. one to us. But uh, you get out towards, start heading out towards Fayetteville, you've actually got quite a few of them. Wow. Well, I guess I know where I'm going to be going soon because I do like Piggly Wiggly. I do like Piggly Wiggly much more than Valentine's Day, but we are capitalizing on it because we perhaps we made a foolish decision, but we made a decision nonetheless uh, to do a relationship Q&A because you and I are apparently a wealth of knowledge. Yeah, or at least people in two different stages of life. So, no, I agree with that. I think we can cover that. The only one that's not here is the single person, but that's okay. They're not well, doing we've, anything. For well, we've both Day been. Anyways. Well, we've both been single, so I feel like we can probably. Oh yeah, I mean, majority majority of my Valentine's Day have been spent single, and it, same. it feels about the same. It it actually does. Um, I'm not. I won't lie. It actually does. Um, I was gonna say something, but I honestly. Because when we're kind of advertising the episode, I think sometimes I get really tired of people giving their advice as gospel. So I'm just going to put it out there immediately that anything I say is just my opinion. And I'm not saying it's 100% the right way or the wrong way, but just want to put it out there and just say that straight up. Oh, yeah. I I would say preface the whole episode with there's no one size fits all for relationship advice. And all we can give is our personal experience. 
Pretty much, yeah. Can't, I mean, can't go telling people what to do or what we think is best in their situation. Just whatever we can relate to the closest in ours is about all all that we can do. That's pretty much that's pretty much all we have. I mean, obviously, I have you know, you and I both have our our religious principles that we stand by that we probably do think are right and wrong. But I've noticed, at least with dating, there is a lot more gray area than people mm-hmm. are willing to admit. Move this light out of the way. <laughs> what light? <laughs> <laughs> oh it's gone now. These ones. <laughs> oh i yeah, love those are. yeah i love those lights i wish they were a little bit higher up though but that's fine um i like it like yeah. this i do too actually <laughs> that looks really good yeah but i'm um, blocking all the light from hitting this part of the wall if i'm not here this whole wall looks really really pretty but with oh. me here oh you ruin everything don't you it, yeah i just block all of it I, i'm just a huge huge uh <laughs> obstacle for all the light to get around there but Fair. let's let's get started what is i don't know if you want to order the uh questions and i am not going to order them or i have least them... the most interesting um I no, don't have... do that that'll make somebody feel bad no no i won't i'm gonna make it very um and i am looking up at my screen right now because I do want to, there's some that just came in, so I just want to take a quick look at that, but I'll take a look at it um, in a second here, and yeah, we're just, what we're going to do is we're just going to go through the questions that have been asked, um, and I'm going to, Connor, you're going to take the first stab at them, um, and then maybe I'll add something, maybe I won't, um, because I've, most of these I've seen, some of these I haven't seen yet, and I haven't had a chance to really look at them, so are you ready, Connor? Okay. Let's go. All right. So the first question is, um, how did you resolve your worst fight? Worst fight? I've been lucky enough that there hasn't been very many horrible fights. In fact, I can count all of them on one hand, and I don't even remember what they're about uh, at this point. But I would say uh, listening to the other person's perspective, like, taking time to stop talking and hear the other person out really try to understand where they're coming from what points they have that that were valid or that weren't or realize where you know i might have been at fault um and then past that you know then you might get that chance to explain yourself again and the thing is i I found that explaining what you meant or what you did over and over the same way is not normally helpful because sometimes people just, they think differently. And the way that I might explain a situation is not how my wife has received it or read the situation or heard it. Um, So sometimes there's some additional context that needs to be had, but I mean, you know, at the end of it, if, if it is all your fault, then apologize. Yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's, that's a pretty fair answer but it even just seems like with anyone that you're debating or having a disagreement with like in simpler terms like it's also just defining your terms like you kind of said like okay if your wife heard it one way and you said it another way it's like okay well what how did you actually mean it then um i think sometimes that Mm -hmm. happens also in just like you know friend debates or you know just stranger debates which typically happen online at this point and no one cares to define their terms we just kind of jump and attack each other but yeah no i I'd, I'd say i agree with that listening is is good and helpful yeah, i guess overall. we could add, make sure it's face to face if you have a disagreement over text or a phone call then if you have a disagreement over text then you can only do long distance and i would say get on the phone have that phone call so you can hear those the voice tone and the voice inflection so they know you're sincere because text can mm-hmm. look sarcastic or like all of our dear parents who seem to put ellipses at the end of everything that just makes their answer sound really ominous <laughs> yeah honestly when someone does that it makes it sound like they're annoyed like when they do like the little dot, dot, dot. Annoyed have... or there's a butt coming. Like, I don't know what it is. Yeah. but it's, uh, I've definitely noticed it, that it's kind of funny. And they're like, no, I'm just like kind of trailing off. Like that's the end of the conversation. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, I, I've learned though, that if it is someone that's older and they use that, I know that they don't mean it in an annoyed way. Like that's mm-hmm. just literally how they text. And so I've, I've learned to adjust to that and I'm fine with it. Um, but yeah, I think, okay, that's a big thing though. I remember at one point, um well let me let me actually protect everyone's privacy and let me just say this is that um 
I have known some people that have tried to have, um, try to air out their feelings with their friends through text message, and it never works. It never mm-hmm. works. It makes everything worse. Um, there's so much miscommunication where it would have you would have saved yourself so much grief if you had just hopped on the phone and actually had had a conversation, and then everything typically gets cleared up. But sending like three paragraph text messages yeah not a good idea phone I calls think... also take less time they do take less time and also they take a little bit less energy because if you think about it with text messages it's spread out through a long period of time right because maybe mm-hmm. you don't respond right away or it takes a couple hours and so you're like fuming on this like you're getting so mad um when you honestly could have done it in 15 minutes and heard them in real time and then actually understood what they were saying as opposed to wasting all your energy getting super mad that you could have been getting super mad over nothing. Oh yeah, totally. Plus you, t- you tend to start reading into stuff and you read it and you reread it and then you write something and then you, re- you, you reword it and you just kind of right. keep going. So, I mean, you're just constantly dwelling on it and processing it and probably making the situation out to be a lot worse than it might actually be i think that's i think that's true and that's not just a that's not just a relationship thing that's a friendship thing too um i've i've mm-hmm. found phone calls typically solve all the problems <laughs> that have that have ever been <laughs> um and it makes everything it makes everything better um i don't know i will i would say though like in in regards to okay resolving like resolving a big fight um and typically, like, because we've talked a little bit about fights that are kind of small and, like, once you talk it out, like, oh, it's just a little bit of a misunderstanding. Um, but if it's, like, a big fight, you know, where there's just a huge or a huge disagreement or you're really upset with the other person and the other person's really upset with you, at least in my experience, I've found it's best to actually take a break and walk away from the situation for a little bit. And I feel like this works the best if you actually trust your partner to think about the situation as well. Because I feel like, at least with my partner and I, nine times out of ten, we both come back together and realized where we had screwed up and made a mistake. And we both apologize, ask for forgiveness, and then we try that conversation again, and it ends up going a lot better when we actually realize what our own fault in it was. Um, Mm Mm-hmm. I don't feel like that works, not to give us a pat on the back or anything, but it doesn't work if the other person is so convinced that they're 100% right and the other person is 100% wrong. Yeah, I mean, normally in a big fight like that, it is going to be, both parties are going to have a little bit of blame to them. Now, I mean, there are certain scenarios where it could all completely fall on one person, um, but I think the tactic of stepping back from it and taking a breather for a little bit is a good idea. And now I don't define a breather as one, two, three, four right, days, same. weeks. That's, that's not it. That's pretending right. like something didn't happen. That's not healthy. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just leaves things really, really muddy. Um, yeah. so when it comes to resolution timing, I mean, I would say, you know, sp- resolve the problem before the sun, you know, goes down and you guys go to bed. Uh, and if you, mm-hmm. if you can't do that because it happened late at night or something, then I mean, you might need to just, you know, take, take an L for the team and be up really late, figuring it out with your significant other or hit it first thing in the morning. But I mean, the longer you let that stuff drag on, the worse right. it's going to be. Right. And I think that's a really good distinction is that taking, taking a step back does not mean you s- step back into the situation and pretend like nothing happened because that never works. Um, yeah, that's probably going to piss somebody off quite a bit more actually. Uh, yeah, I couldn't imagine. I feel like that honestly just be gaslighting to me and be like, what? Nothing's happened. What are you talking about? Of course, it, something it, happened. It, is, it is gaslighty. It certainly is. I mean, I mean, you are pretending like something didn't happen now if you guys have to save face for a little bit to get through at a you know family event or a party Mm -hmm. where something happened then that's understandable because you can't solve it right then and there well it's Um, like you make an agreement with your partner that you're doing it like if you're in an event you both are like hey we need to put this on pause 
we'll talk about it when we get back in the car, you know? And, and so both, mm-hmm. both parties are in agreement that that's what you're doing. That doesn't mean that, you know, it didn't happen. It just means that we're putting a pause on it and then we'll come back to it later. Yeah. And I think, I think that's yep. totally reasonable. Yeah, I think it is blowing up at each other in the moment doesn't work. You have to stay calm. If you are going to blow up or you are blowing up, then you really need to take a take a step back, take a breather and, and wait till you can reenter the conversation calmly. Yeah. And I relate to that because I have, I have a pretty good temper um, and I've worked very hard on it over the past, oh, I don't know, forever because I've had it for forever. Um, and so for me, stepping back is really important because I need time for my energy to go down. And once my energy kind of goes down, I start to think about it very rationally and I go, ah, you were getting very emotional here, <laughs> you know, and I can kind of come back with a clear head and a, and, a, and be able to handle the situation a little bit better. So for me, for me, I think that's, that's key. And also on a more spiritual level, I do get time, talk to the Lord, you know, be in scripture. And, and typically, typically I find some level of conviction there at some point mm-hmm. of something that I've done wrong. Because like in, like in arguments, like, yes, it can definitely be like, like one person has more of the blame or one person has this much blame. Um, but it's never, it's never like 100% the other person. It's typically like 80, 20, you know, 70, 30, maybe it's 40, 60, but for the most part, you can, if you look hard enough, you can usually find something that's your fault. Um, with the exception, obviously, I'm not including like abusive relationships or anything like that. That's a that's a different story. I'm talking about like a healthy relationship mm-hmm. where disagreements happen. All right. Cool. I've got nothing else to really add to that. Nope. I think that's good. Other than All if right. you if you want to avoid significant other arguments, then don't get a significant other. So you could just stay Through single. That. That's one way to. That's one way. I mean, but you're still gonna have arguments with other people. So that's, that's the only one that you can get rid of. I feel like anytime you intimately intertwine your life with someone else's, you're just going to have disagreements and you're mm-hmm. going to have to figure out how to work through them. Um, but yeah, no, good stuff. Um, okay, so this one is a little bit more of a, um, I guess, more religious question. So going more from the Christian perspective um, is how can you both grow separately in the Lord, but also together in the Lord. What do you think, Connor? I think initially it sounds like a bit more of a difficult question than it is, but honestly, just make sure every time that you're growing when the Lord isn't with the other person, like Mm -hmm. you're not doing Bible studies because the other person's doing them with you. And you're not going to church because the other person's going with you or going to worship or volunteering or group or whatever it might be. If you're always doing it with that person, you will always be growing with them. And the minute that they're not with you anymore, you're probably going to just tip over and, and fall apart. So make sure you're doing that stuff on your own. That's kind of all I would really have to say on it. I think. Yeah, no, I I think you're, I think you're dead on. Um, And I think too, kind of, I guess, adding a little bit of scenario to it. I think, I think for a lot of teenagers that grow up in the church, I think this is the one thing that I think is absolutely true that the church did teach on dating because there's some stuff you and I could get into that, but there's some stuff with, with the church that I'm not, not like a super big fan of, but they do. I think the good piece of advice is, is grow with the Lord on your own before you add someone else in. Because if you try to grow with just someone, like with the Lord, it's like you said, like you're just doing it for the other person. You don't have any foundation mm-hmm. underneath it. Um, so I think, I typically think that's a good idea. And that's probably one of the reasons why I'm against um, high schoolers dating. Um, I think it's a good idea to build a foundation with the Lord if you can um, while you're in high school as difficult as it is. Uh, but yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that you have to do it on your own first. And then I feel like growing together kind of comes as a byproduct of growing separately. Yeah. And then growing is going to continue afterwards. Um, oh yeah. You never stop. There's, 
Yeah, you're not you're not going to stop. So I mean that that'll get a little bit murky for people that are wondering like, oh, how much do I need to grow in the Lord before I can bring somebody else in? And well, that, that really is a is murkier question. Yeah. yeah, I mean it's getting into the details, but it's going to be dependent on the individual person. There might be somebody that's had a really foundational uh, experience with God and they're ready to get married at you know seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, and mm-hmm. just start having kids in their early twenties or what or right away, whatever it might be. Um, but other people might take longer uh, for that to happen. And yeah, yeah, I mean, even, even as a married person, I'm still spending time on my own with God. So not everything I do is with my wife. So I still have my own individual journey, but it's now intertwined with somebody else's. Yeah. Well, I mean, it would be honestly kind of shocking if you didn't, it would be good if your entire spiritual life was now dependent on your wife. Like you have to have your own time to do your own studying Mm because, you know, this is going to sound really really morbid and really sad but you know we're not promised to have our spouses forever right we're just not um and so god god is always there though and so that's the relationship that we have to we have to continue we have to continue to build i'm shocked that we're not disagreeing on a ton yet so i'm a little disappointed i mean if we got into more of the details we probably would disagree on some stuff yeah, but that would be boring for everyone else. Maybe maybe one day we'll we'll have to find some stuff that we really disagree on with dating and relationships cuz I feel like there are things for sure, but we're just not getting mm-hmm. to them here. Okay. Next question. Um now this one uh this one I actually haven't read yet, so we'll see here. Um the question is how can a Christian couple again, another religious question. How can a Christian couple re- resolve if they have any, if they have different ideas of what a relationship consists of? I think that's a broad question. Um, I think it. And it doesn't I, just apply to Christian or religion. Uh, I mean, that's any yeah, relationship. I would agree. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it depends on, it depends on like, it depends on what you guys are differing on. If you guys are having differing ideas of relationship if one person says sex is involved and one person says sex isn't involved um in a relationship and by relationship i mean a non-married relationship then yeah i mean that's a that's a massive that's a massive difference um and that's not just a relationship difference that's a moral difference as well uh but if you're talking about small things um in relationship i think that's something that can be um I guess as Jordan Peterson might put it, negotiated a little bit. Um, but if it's a, like a <laughs> fundamental, if it's a fundamental issue, then then that's something that either you have to decide to walk away or mm-hmm. see if, if that's something that they're willing to change, not just because you want them to, but because they too feel a certain moral obligation to not do something or to do something. Yeah, that one, it really depends on what we're talking about. Like you said, the small stuff you can negotiate on, people can agree to disagree and move past it. But if you're talking about foundational principles, like one, somebody's Christian, somebody's Muslim or Buddhist and uh, uh, somebody is Hindu, it that's not going to work out like the principles are too different. I mean, even within the same cult of Christianity, you could say that you know, Christian or uh, Pentecostals and Baptists probably not going to get along. They, I mean, they're like, there's their, there's their own fundamental disagreements. You and me have uh, ideological differences on women's roles in the church. And that could be a breaking point for some people that are looking to get in a relationship. Um, At the same point, it also be... could not be a, a breaking point, right? Like that's the thing, like part oh, yeah. of it is up to the individual. Um the individual themselves, like if I'm just, I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about things that would affect how they live their life. And if, uh, if a guy's dating a girl who wants to be a pastor and the guys strictly know women being pastor, well, you're probably going to have some issues down, down the road there. Agreed. Yeah. No, children, no children, five children, two children. Like those are kind of their big deals you know, wants to live in a cold climate, you know, wants to move to Florida or something like those. I mean, those are all the questions I think are important and people should, some of those should be brought up honestly before they start dating and they should definitely be brought up during dating. I I've been really surprised when I found couples that 
dated for years, got engaged, got married. And then it was like, Oh, I want to have six kids. And then the other one's like, I want two. Yeah. You yeah. never had no. this question before. I would advise you have this I, question before you tie yourself to somebody. I don't even understand a world where you don't have those questions. Like I, I don't, I feel like this is something that, um, you know, my partner and I end up talking about pretty early on, to be honest. Um, I don't, cause I think, I think at least for us, like with the whole kids thing, like there was definitely some negotiating there. We found somewhere that was, you know, a good, good middle ground. We were both happy with it. Um, mm -hmm. But I just don't. And also that's, that's one thing too, that I think there has to be some discernment of what you choose to negotiate on and what you choose not to negotiate on. Um, I don't think mm -hmm. it's always going to be this black and white thing. Um, like the idea no. of, I think the idea of, like the women's pastors thing is a good is a good thing to actually use as an example because it's not a primary issue some would consider this more like a mm -hmm. secondary issue where you definitely depending on your beliefs you could negotiate on that um but mm -hmm. if you're in a christian relationship and you know your partner's like oh no jesus isn't the son of god you know it's like oh well you know maybe maybe this is a fundamental disagreement and i and i wouldn't you know, I wouldn't recommend uh, I wouldn't recommend missionary dating them and trying to get them to change that way. Yeah, and I mean, I can speak to that uh, personally because when uh, people that I've dated in the past and maybe there's something they preferred or didn't prefer, and I would try to change myself or change my beliefs and the way that I acted for that person. If you are doing that, I recommend you stop. And if the other person doesn't like that, then you're, you probably need to rethink being in a relationship with them. And it's kind of as simple as that. If you have to go changing yourself, especially core values and core beliefs or like your personality, then mm -hmm. it's not, it's not worth it. Yeah. Well, I mean, the question too is for both parties involved, do you want the relationship to have longevity and is you pretending to be a Christian or pretending to agree with this person on this thing or change your habits and your hobbies, is that going to be sustainable in the long run? And yeah. the answer is no. Like as much as I would like, and I'm, I'm in a Christian relationship, but say, say I wasn't, and I was with someone who's a non-Christian, as much as I want them to practice the same things as me I don't want them to practice the same things as me to play pretend to be to be like mm -hmm. oh I have to do this like I would rather them just be honest up front and be like honestly I don't love the Lord I I don't really believe in Christianity um the, I'll I'll go to church with you maybe but I don't really believe these things that's actually fine like I'd prefer that over someone just kind of conforming with their behavior because it eventually it will fade away, especially if you get married and you're in the same proximity with that person for a long period of time, they will end up, they'll end up showing their true colors eventually. We all do. Oh yeah. No, you, you can't hide that. I'm trying to remember there's a time frame for how long it takes for you to get to know a person. Basically, I wish I could remember what it was. I know, I know it's more than, I, I want to say it's like around three months or something like three months getting to know somebody and you'll eventually three to six months, somewhere in there you'll eventually get to know, you'll see like more sides of that person than you do up front. Like everybody has their, their public persona, public face, they're extra polite, they're extra nice. Uh, but then you get to see them behind the scenes. And I mean, somewhere, somewhere along the way, life's going to hand them a bad day and you'll see how they get to respond to that bad day. Right. And, right. you know, if you're involved in it, you'll get to see how they respond to you. Or even if you're not involved, you might see how they respond to you just for being a, uh, a witness, uh, to whatever has happened to them. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think I'm trying to think of like the different stages, but I want to say, I think the first six months from what I know is like, you are putting your best you are putting your best foot forward. Um, and then from what I, at least from what I know, and I think that this is accurate, even just based upon what I've witnessed, is that like at six months, you kind of, the honeymoon phase isn't gone necessarily, but you do start having like, it does start kind of settling in that this could be a long-term thing. 
and you have to ev- essentially evaluate, you know, whether or not you want to be committed or not. Mm-hmm. Um, I have, I feel like I've seen a lot of relationships end at the six month marks mark of things where like kind of like the really high high honeymoon stuff is over and the reality is setting in that you could actually end up with this person for the rest of your life (laughs) and there's and that's your only one and that's your only choice and then you're like oh i'm gonna i'm gonna break it off then um i don't think that's Mm -hmm. i don't think it's a set formula or anything so if you don't fit into that formula it's okay but um i feel like there is some some level of truth to it yeah, I would agree to that. And then I think at the year point is when you start. Um, I, I honestly do like the term negotiating. I think that's the best way of putting it because it's not just compromise, um, but you start negotiating, you know, your own time and you know, what you guys want to do and like what a mm-hmm. long term relationship looks like. Um, I would say that's pretty fair. Yeah, I've. I'd have to go into the definitions to see the distinction between compromise and negotiate, but negotiate certainly seems um, like the two parties are actively involved in creating a scenario that they're happy with. Compromise makes me think that both parties are just happy that the other one's losing as much as they are. That's usually what I tend to associate <laughs> with uh, with a compromise. You're yeah. equally unhappy at this point. Um I mean, and that's not, that's not how you would want, that's not how you would want to go about, uh, an issue in a relationship. I think negotiate might be the better term if yeah. just to put a more positive spin on it. Well, cause like with negotiating, everyone does get something at the end, but both parties have to agree and be happy with it. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, as, a uh, as kind of cold as it sounds, almost like a contract negotiation, you know, you have to you know, make sure both parties are happy, you know, we're all getting something, but we're not getting everything that we want, which is fine. And it's completely normal because in a relationship, you do have to give and take a little bit. Like that's, that's why relationships are so hard. And that's why I feel like a lot of people don't do well at them um, because there is some level of sacrifice that has to be had. Mm Mm-hmm. But good stuff. Okay. Next question. Um, okay, this one is not um, this one is not particularly religious. Um, this one is actually a little bit more political. Um, what should a couple do if they realize they have different differing political views on key issues after they're married? <laughs> <laughs> Live with it. <laughs> well, let's see. There could be a sudden realization of your political leanings. There could be a change of heart. Whatever the circumstances are, it sounds like we got a married. Hypothetically, we've got a married couple here with different political leanings. Right. <sighs> you can't honestly you just can't. deal with it. <laughs> well, I'm think I honestly would go back to the dating stage though, because I feel like I feel like you have to line up somewhat politically with your um with your significant other especially in regards to really big key issues like i guess the best example i can think of is abortion like that's not just a political issue that's typically a moral issue of some of some sort um and it's a pretty big one so you don't want to have too much disagreement there um so i feel like that's something that should have been worked out in in dating at some point um but if should have been but i think for the sake of the question you could consider it wasn't or somebody changed their mind now they're married i would man if it were me i would honestly still try to convince and persuade the person to to rethink um obviously stay married to them like you know you know don't don't leave them like that's a that's bad advice um but definitely stay with them and keep working on it um especially if it's something so fundamental um you know like uh like abortion or um you know transgenderism or or something you know that's a creation issue um and of course i'm i'm obviously coming from a bit of a christian perspective here i can't help it um but stuff like that, yeah, I think you know you keep working on it and you and you keep and you keep pressing and see if there's a change there. 
Yeah, uh, I would say stick it out and keep loving on the other person. I, there's, as you know, I, I'm going to take divorce as an option out because I don't, I don't think that's a divorceable uh, reason. At least it's not biblically; it's not listed as one. Um, and then for other people that aren't Christian, I mean, I don't, I wouldn't recommend divorce for people. I mean, that it just. The thing is, like you said, it, these are questions that should be fielded before they get married. And the thing is, is I feel like a lot of people won't ask questions like that when they know that divorce is always like their 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 plan B, their last option. And if things get really, really bad and, you know, my my spouse ends up becoming a Republican or a Democrat or a Libertarian or a Socialist or uh, a Cold Stone capitalist, whatever it might be that, you know, they're not at the time. And they've always got that idea that I can just, I can just break the, the marriage contract and I'll get out of it. You know, it'll be a, it'll be a pain in the butt, especially if there's kids involved and that's going to hurt them. And we're going to have to shuffle them around and figure out visiting rights and, and all of that. And it, you know, it's messy, but I mean, it takes a lot of the responsibility off their plate in the beginning. Um, so, I mean, it really does come down to fielding who you're going to who you're going to pledge the rest of your life to. It's it's fielding them, uh, fielding those questions out to them, and really, really trying to uh, sort this stuff out beforehand. But I mean, afterwards, yeah. you're in the contract, you're married. You know, love on them. Don't start calling them a. a, a what a Democrat or Demorat or Repu- like all the different, all the different name calling and stuff that comes along with it, uh, with the political, uh, divisiveness. Like if you feed into that, if you feed that into your marriage, then you will end up destroying it. Yeah. Well, you, you grow a certain level of contempt and disgust for the other person, um, which can, which can build up whether it's political or if it's because of something that annoys you about them. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm a, I'm much more, uh, I think I'm much more conservative on divorce. Um, I, I, unless it's abuse, um, I, uh, you, you stay in it. I mean, the, and that's the thing that I, I still think about and I'm, I haven't landed on it completely with marriage is once you're married, you know, that's it. Like you've said that you love them and you've committed to them. And so you're telling me that if someone changes their political viewpoint on you, that that love that you said that you have for them ceases to exist and you break off your contract. You know, it's to me, it's just not good enough. Um, and it kind of makes it makes every single vow that you've taken pretty cheap. Um, so the only option in my mind, I think it's what you said, Connor, it is it is serving them. Um, it's loving them, um, even when you have a fundamental disagreement, um, and you hope and you pray that there's a that there's a change of heart. Um, if it's something that's super major uh, in both of your guys's relationship. Yep, I would agree with it. All right, next question. Okay, this is a good one. Um, how can a couple learn to communicate well if one of them processes internally and the other processes externally? And this one, this one, I actually feel like I, I, I feel like I'm still trying to figure it out because like my partner is an internal processor, like all the way internal, like it's all here. Me, I have Mm -hmm. to talk about it a ton, like a lot. Um, and so I think this is the part where I actually would say that you do have to compromise a little bit and understand that, okay, the other person might not be super good at externally processing, um, but if they can do it a little bit, then I can flex a little bit with them too and kind of meet a little bit somewhere in the middle. Like, I don't think it's a good idea to try to change the other person to make them be more like you um but i do think that you can meet in the middle and i think with communication it's almost vital that you meet in the middle it's one of those things Mm -hmm. that has to exist no matter what so at least for me in my experience there's definitely been some level of negotiating and compromising and also just expressing 
expressing, you know, my needs to my partner. And also too, sometimes I, there's, there's also points when I will absolutely beat something to death when I should honestly just stop talking (laughs) um, and kind of let that person process on their own and me talking to them constantly does not help. That's just, that's just for my end though. And that really is an experiential answer. Yeah, I think whoever's asking the question, I mean, they've made the first step. They've already identified they process things differently, one internally, one externally. And like you said, you're, you, I mean, you have to take that into consideration about the partner that you're with. So you love them, understand that they process internally and they're not going to want to talk about it right away. Or at least whatever it is you just said, you need to give them time to think about it before they respond. Personally, that's me. Internally processing it until I think I've got it, collected my thoughts bring that to the external. Um, although I have been known to take something external and beat it, you know, beat that horse to death. Uh, it can happen. And I realize I need to, I need to jump back into my internal, um, or let them have their internal processing moment. But I mean, it is, it really is a shared, uh, experience. You do have to give and take a little bit understand that you might need to shut up for a bit and the other person needs to understand that they're going to have to talk about it. They can't just keep it all inside because that person can't read their mind, their thoughts, their body language and get an accurate representation of what they're thinking. Right. Yeah. And I think, I I do think that when you're in a relationship with someone, if you are an internal processor, you have to learn to communicate a little bit better However, if you are an external processor, you have to understand that maybe they're going to need a little bit of time just to think through what you've said. And then as an external processor, you have to be okay with waiting for an answer as opposed to getting it right away. And so, again, it's, mm-hmm. it's both sides has to compromise a little bit. Um, and they ha- you have to understand that about the other person. Anything more for that one, Connor? Yeah. Trying to think of something else to add, and I don't have anything, so no. Okay, cool. All right, so I have one that's actually going to be specifically for you, Connor, because this is a married person question that I can't answer. So I'm going to let right. you answer it. <laughs> um, so what are some key ways to keep romance alive in a marriage after the initial feelings have faded? Um, what would you suggest Connor? (laughs) So that uh, is something that working on putting into practice and that's honestly going on, on weekly dates. It's to like have that mindset that I'm still trying to date my wife, still trying to court her. If you stop doing that after you're married, then things will start to just uh, fizzle out. Um, And going out on a date and treating her special uh kind of reignites that that type of those type of feelings that you might have had beforehand um so though i think we've kind of settled on like uh weekly small dates which could be like a, a small date uh out or staying inside and then once a month going out and splurging a bit on a nice dinner or something we just went uh, i just took her out to a uh, korean barbecue this weekend mm. It was pricey. It was really, really good though. The experience was fun, uh, yeah. sitting there cooking all the different food and, and trying everything. And then we, you know, got up and went and got coffee the next morning and stuff. And I was lucky enough to have travel points from, uh, from my work that we, I also had like a free hotel night. So we went and just picked a hotel in Charlotte and stayed at one, um, and just kind of made a little excursion out of it. Uh, and then of course for your anniversary, make it a bigger trip, like make that, make that important. Even when you've got kids, um, that's something that, you know, right now, while we don't have kids, we have to put into practice having a dog kind of helps cause you had to set up somebody to take care of the dog and stuff. So you kind of get in that mindset that there's things at home that need, need to be taken care of, but regardless, your spouse comes first and you need to take care of them. Um, and I don't know, you might disagree with me on this, but I would put your spouse above your kids. I mean, it's certainly oh, no, I completely, pets. I completely agree with that completely. Okay. Everything Not everybody agrees said. with that. Uh, oh no, I completely I, I, agree. I land on putting a spouse first before the kids simply because uh, at the end of your life, your kids will not be living with you. They're going to, you know, move out and get their own life. And 
it's just going to be you and your spouse for a long time. Yeah. And if no, you haven't I, worked on that in the 25, 35 years as you've been, you know, raising kids, well, what's that going to look like at that point? So continuously working on your marriage, I think is really important uh, just because your spouse has pledged their life to you. Uh, you know, you guys are taking care of the kids, but once again, the kids will become adults. You push them out the door and that, that's kind of it for them. Yeah. I don't think I've ever agreed with you so much like ever. <laughs> um, I, <laughs> I was like, that is, I was like, that is, if, if I were married, that's exactly what I would say. Um, yeah, I completely, I completely agree with you there. And I think, I think the thing that's the kind of unsaid thing of what you, what of your response was essentially as unsexy as it is, like scheduling things out, like, Oh yeah. No, it be... doesn't, it doesn't feel good to schedule things. It's, it's like, you know, maybe when you're, you're younger and you're dating and you're going out and it's like, it's impromptu, it's a spur mm -hmm. of the moment date. Like, Hey, like, let's go out on one tomorrow. Maybe you can still do that, you know, on certain nights, but you're going to have a much better success if you start scheduling that stuff out. Right. I agree. Um, and I think too, like, obviously I cannot speak for your wife, but I think most women, do like the idea of the man like taking in that time like like you said make her feel special you know plan a date you know and that and that really helps mm -hmm. uh, with with romance um and i know i know the thing that you said that you thought i was going to disagree with is putting your spouse above the kids i think that's something that women really struggle with um obviously i'm not married i don't have i don't have children but i know I know that this is a, an issue for women because it's something that gets brought up a lot is that women, they can definitely fall into the trap of taking care of their kids so much that they don't take care of their husband in any way. And yes, I do mean that in an emotional way, but also in a physical way as well. And then before you know mm -hmm. it, the, like you said, the kids leave the house and he kind of feels neglected they don't really know where their marriage is and it's kind of a struggle. Um, so I think yeah, now, you're, now you're living, a, living in the house with a stranger. Yeah. And you're basically just roommates essentially. Um, yeah. And I think also, yeah, and that's, too, and that's not where it's not where you want to get. No, but I mean, even too, like, even if you get into that stage where you are feeling like roommates, like, you know, don't just keep that in your head. Like, communicate that because i'm sure like every couple has fallen into that where they just kind of feel like they're just existing together and in the same kind of routine like you can just communicate that that's a thing and then and then try to figure out how to solve that and i think what you said connor um solves it pretty well to be honest yeah and i, mean, and I can say from personal experience because it was you know just running into this new year and being like you know we haven't done anything particularly special at this point. So, you know, it, it, let's, let's go out and have a date and have a good time and, you know, pretend like, pretend like you're dating again, uh, you know, go around and open the door for her and, and pull her chair out and all of those things and take her somewhere nice, like not where you're normally going once you're married. Uh, I think that those type of things just, it brings back those special moments. Um, and it also, can bring back memories from the days that you, you were dating. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. so, I mean, there's, there's a lot to be said for, for doing something like that. And yeah, it, it sounds annoying to schedule that out. It sounds kind of weird to schedule it out. Like I'm going to schedule this with my spouse that we're going to go out on this day and we're going to go to these places. Um, I will add though, I don't mind if she, if she ends up, uh, planning some of the dates, because sure. the thing yeah. is, I, every time I plan it, I'm probably going to be thinking about her and what places she might enjoy. So if she ever wants to take her hands and take me somewhere that I might enjoy more, <laughs> yeah, I'm totally game for it. Right. Right. Yep. No, I, I think I think that's good. Um, and, you know, I think I know you too well enough, but I think because you guys both love each other, like, I think you she would pick out. I'm trying to figure out the best way of putting it is that you guys would be able to find something that you both enjoy, um, together. Oh um, yeah. And I know you guys have enough shared interest, um, to be able to do that for sure. So no, that's good stuff. Anything more you want to add to that? No, I don't think so. Cool. Okay, great. Um, 
Okay, this one might be hard for us both to answer, so we'll see if we can answer this one. Um, okay. And maybe we'll go a bit more rapid fire because we're making. We, it up we can always follow here. on the answer of don't get don't get in a relationship. So. That's. Just, I don't think it's a good. I don't think it's a great answer, depending <laughs> on the person. But it is an answer that we it's can a, try. Um, and it is a biblical one with a caveat to it, but it is a biblical one. Well, well, yeah. There's a huge caveat of dedicate yourself to the Lord. Uh, that's uh, and you know don't be single and just have a bunch of one night stands. Um, would ha- would oh, not. Oh, I'm thinking. I'm thinking. I'm thinking of the. Is it? Shoot, I can't remember if it's Peter or Paul. I switch them up all the time in my head, but Peter or Paul is... It's Paul. It's better to remain single or better to not marry. Yeah. But he's like... If now, you there's more to that passion. verse, but that's how he yeah. starts it off. And it's like... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think this is... I was actually thinking about this the other day with that, um, is that there's a lot of, at least in my experience being in the church and talking to young young people, and I acknowledge I'm young myself, but I'm talking about more teenagery, so I'm not quite in the teenage mm-hmm. years, um, where they're so excited about, they're so excited about getting married and all the benefits. They don't think about any of the of the downfalls to it. Not I don't want to say downfalls, but like the negative side. Like there's um, because Paul also continues on, and he's like, you know, a man that has a wife, you know, he has to think about. He can't just think about God, but he also has to think about how he how he has to please his wife. Um, and so mm-hmm. it does there is an extra element of complexity to maintaining a relationship with God when you are also, at least as a man, you're also responsible for leading your wife as well and also pleasing your wife and taking care of your wife and taking care of your children. Yeah, which is also pleasing in God. So Getting married and then neglecting your wife and kids and focusing only on God's not necessarily going to make him very happy with you in the end, I would say. That's right. That's right. So, I mean, it's just, again, I don't think there's a right or wrong to it. I think there's a lot. There's more responsibilities for sure. There, there are. Um, but marriage is good. Uh, it's pleasing. Um, it's great. But you have to think of the full picture. And it's not just, I think for Christians, I'm just going to say it very bluntly for those that, um, most Christians at least believe in waiting for marriage. And so a lot of, uh, a lot of young teenagers get very excited about getting married because they can have sex and they're like, yay, sex. And then it's like, wait a minute, there's way more to marriage than just having sex. You know, there's, there's a lot Mm -hmm. more that happens there. Um, so don't just rush into a marriage because you want to, because you want to sleep together. That that's also another good piece of advice. Okay, um, we got off on a rabbit trail. So here's the question. <laughs> um, how can an extrovert and an introvert find balance in their life together? And the reason why I said this one's going to be hard for me is because I think both both, uh, both my partner and I were both kind of introverted. So this is not, mm-hmm. this is not like a, it's not super, I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit more extroverted than he is, but doesn't tend to it's at least it's not an issue for us right now yeah so i think the question is probably hitting mostly on uh the social life Mm. and and how to deal with that and oh this will kind of kind of be a similar answer to the external internal processing and there's going to have to be some give or take um but as an introvert myself uh, and I usually say that I'm an extroverted introvert. Uh, I prefer, I prefer to be in small groups or left alone, um, but would get me around the right people. And I become quite a bit more, quite a bit more extroverted. I mean, I just went on a trip the other week with my wife and three other introverts, but all five of us being introverts <laughs> together yeah. on a, on a multi-day trip, <laughs> including like a seven, eight hour road trip. And it's like, well, how did that go? Actually, it went great because all of these people, we all get along. We also all understood we were introvert, introverts to varying degrees, but it's like, okay, well, this person needs their time alone. All right, we're going to leave them alone. Um, now, bringing in somebody that's full-scale extrovert, like it really depends on the introvert and how introverted they are to be in a really extroverted situation. I had a friend that was extremely extroverted, love to have big parties, lots of people dancing, 
karaoke, all the things that I don't do, don't care to do. Um, and I think there was an understanding that I would come and I would hang out, but I'm not necessarily going to participate because it's too much for me. Mm -hmm. And luckily that person was understanding. And so like when the friends would try to hit the other friends would try to get me to, to join in, he would kind of come along and be like, he's, he's not going to like, like, just leave him alone. (laughs) Let him live. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. So there's, there's a give or take there. Um, I, I like, I don't know. I don't know what happens to an extrovert when they're just around a bunch of introverts. It's kind of a hard place to find yourself. They kind of, honestly, extroverts, they just kind of get neutered after a while. I think that's kind of what I feel like happens. They, they just kind of, they just kind of level out. They, yeah. they, they, they bring it down a few notches. Well, you they might, conform. they're going to be better at reading the room. No, that's true. I mean, you do conform to your spouse though. I feel like that does happen where, you know, you do end up becoming more like your partner. Um, and if the introvert wants to stay in, you know, it's a lot easier for the extrovert to stay in than try to pull the, the pull the introvert out. Um, mm-hmm. But the introvert can't always be the one that's keeping the extrovert home and should probably that's go out. Right. That's right. Or the extrovert, Again, you know, gets gets some uh, gets some other friends that they can go out with that their their partner trusts and and yeah. leave it at that. Yeah. But I they mean, they really that's... they really should try to step into each other's world. Uh, at least a little bit, not every time uh, no, I, agree. I wouldn't do that to them. Yeah, no, I think it should be, I think it should be a mixture of both. Um, but also too, I mean, I think what you said though is good that you should have other people that you hang out with too. Um, that's a little bit more like if you are a bit more extroverted, you know, if you have a group of girlfriends or guy friends, like you are totally allowed to go do something a little bit more extroverted with your friend, mm-hmm. like, your spouse can't or your partner can't fulfill all your needs. It's just not going to happen that way. Yeah. The other thing is there's probably a couple of your extroverted friends that just might be able to tone it down enough that they get along really well with your introverted spouse. And then you can have a smaller get together Yeah, where you I might see compromise. your introverted. Yeah. Your, your introverted spouse might come out a bit more, uh, kind of come out of their shell a bit more and kind of enjoy you know, a smaller party, but big scale stuff at a, at a club or a karaoke night. Probably not. (laughs) Yeah. That's not even my thing. I, I am, I definitely like, I like more small social gatherings like those. Mm -hmm. I am all about, I could do those pretty much all the time. Um, except for when I can't, which is when I'm tired, (laughs) which is a lot, but, um, (laughs) Yeah, I, I think I think there can be some compromise there. Um, let's see here. There's a few more questions. Um, okay, so I'm going to ask two more. Um, I think the first, I think I'm going to ask, um, let me ask this one. Uh, my spouse seems so attached to their mother to the point that she takes priority in his life over our marriage, what can I do? Well, as, as the spouse that's asking this question, I don't know that there's much you can do other than have those conversations that, you know, you feel like you're, you're knocked down on the prioritization list. And as for the spouse, who's prioritizing the mother, you need to let go. Drop your mother. I don't care if it's a if it's a mother daughter relationship or mother son relationship. Drop her. You, as soon as you married your wife, that became the most important woman in the world to you. Right. And mm-hmm. your mother is down to second until you have a daughter, and then your mother's down to third. Like your mother is not going <laughs> to get further up the list. She's just going to keep dropping further down. She needs to accept it. You need to accept it, and deal with it. Like, yeah, that's something that would just, comp- that'll completely deval- devalue your wife if you feel like, uh, or your husband, honestly. I mean, it could go either way, but it's going to devalue your your spouse. Yeah. I think on a practical level, I agree. I agree with what you're saying, but I think on a practical level, you can start doing that by creating boundaries. Boundaries yep. are not Boundaries a would be a good idea. place, but you're going to have to have a conversation about it to begin with. Now, if the spouse is not willing to create those boundaries, then we have a different problem. Yeah, and that's and that's honestly, I am not against 
um, the idea of marriage counseling. I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing to have a third party uh, in there that you trust, that you can explain both sides to. And if that person in the middle is like, yeah, dude, like you are way too attached to your mom. <laughs> um, you know, I, I mm-hmm. think I think that's a good sign for you, at least, to to take a step back and say, OK, well, you know, what do I need? What do I need to change? How do I need to change it? And also, I think you brought up a good point too, Connor, that it can make your wife feel devalued um, that you put mom over, you know, the wife all the time. Like that's that can that can yeah. really that can really hurt a marriage, to be honest. I think that can cause a good amount of damage and it can cause it can also cause resentment from the wife towards you and also cause resentment towards the person that you love, which is your mom. So it actually is loving overall to (laughs) demote your mom um, Mm -hmm. and then raise up your spouse. And then the mom might be mad about it for a little bit and she might be mad about it for the rest of her life. But at the end of the day, the person that you're waking up to is your wife, hopefully not your mother. Yeah. This is the same scenario of the, uh, you know, valuing your spouse over your kids. Mm -hmm. I, I think I said it in there to value them over your parents. Yeah. I would agree with that. Um, 100, 100% there with you. Man, we're killing it. Okay, last question, uh, which I think is a fun one that I think even if no one brought this up, I think I would have brought it up anyway because I think you and I might have different opinions on this, um, is what uh, are your guys' thoughts on uh, dating apps? I'll let you go first, Cotter. <laughs> so I might be lengthy and I have a lot to say, but maybe I won't say that much. I'll let you say most of it. Um, well, it'll depend on the it depends on the dating app. If it's a hookup app like Bumble or something, then no. Um, or Tinder, no. Other apps though, I mean I guess to, on the as far as like our time goes, like and from the perspective of where we're at with technology, I would say that it it could be appropriate. Um, it's not my recommendation, but you know if we pull back a hundred years, well now we don't have we certainly don't have texting. You don't really you've got phones, uh, but they're not in your pocket anymore. So depending on how how you want to frame this argument you could argue that you should not do long distance at all, uh, which would, I mean, it would get rid of internet dating. It would get rid of anything long distance where video calls, phones, text messages. So that really just limits you to the people in your life at work, at church, at wherever you volunteer, uh, your neighborhood, uh, that pool gets, that pool gets pretty small. Um, so for people that are struggling to find people within that pool, whether there's, there's nobody you're interested in, or maybe there physically isn't somebody for you in that, in that smaller pool, then, you know, internet dating could be, uh, could be an option again, not my first choice. Mm -hmm. Um, but I understand why people have turned to it. Uh, they, it can do a lot of filtering for you, assuming people on the other end are honest about who they are. Uh, but yeah. you also, I mean, there's plenty of people that are dishonest when they're to your face. So, I mean, things don't change yeah. that much to me. You, I mean, you, you will be lacking like the body language and stuff and those personal interactions, but I, I mean, you've heard of plenty of people faking it in person. I mean, heck, people couldn't tell that certain other people were serial killers when they met them, thought they were the nicest people on earth. They didn't right. have to do it online. They did it in person. Um, so I I mean, it really depends for me on the context of, of where you want to come from. If somebody says no to online dating, because you're looking through a list of people, you're just purveying that list of of people and going through to see if there's a a match or something like that. It's, it's honestly just a sped up process of what you do in real life. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's interesting. I, I only, I only partially agree with you um Mm -hmm. i think i'd add a little bit more to it where at least at least when i because i don't think you've ever 
online dated before. Have you, Connor? No, not seriously. Jokingly okay. have created a profile just to see what it looked yeah. like. Yeah. yeah. Wanted to look at it and see like, okay, that. like how does, <laughs> how does this work? Yeah. We, we, we messed around with Tinder to see what it would do. And it was just, yeah. it, it was, it was horrendous. I've looked at other ones like eHarmony and stuff just to see, I just, I'm interested in how they actually work. Yeah. Yeah. Like how do they profile people? Um, because it is essentially, they're all profiles that we knowingly or unknowingly use ourselves and our every, you know, and our every day, uh, just going around and meeting people. Um, mm -hmm. if, if anybody's ever had those thoughts where they're just talking to a random person or even somebody they know, and you're like, well, could I marry this person? And then you list off the reasons in your head why you can't or why you could. I mean, that's, that's those filters that they have, you know, that, uh, eHarmony has or whatever. It's those filters just acting out in real life. They've just gone and yeah. just put it up against more people than you could ever take up you know, in a split second, basically. And now they're all put in front of you. Yeah. And that's, and that's where I partly agree with you. And then I partly see the negative of that because you see it more as, as a positive, but to me, I see it more as a negative where you almost have too many options out there. And it's almost, I think it's almost overwhelming and draining to have to go through all those different options. There's actually, um, there's actually like a study on it, I think, that came out recently. I'd have to I'd have to go find it again and maybe I'll put it in our Instagram story or something. Um, but basically how people are just getting so overwhelmed by all these different options of people that they just almost you're almost paralyzed with indecision, um, essentially. And then you also mentioned too, like, you know, you do have people that are just trying to hook up, which you know, obviously, if you're looking for a long lasting relationship, you know, that can um, that's not what you're looking for. But in real life, though, I can avoid those people pretty easily. <laughs> like I can avoid all the people that are trying to trying to hook up with me. Um, if I if I go like, for example, um, if I go to like church or something, you know, there's a lower likelihood that I'm going to run into hookup culture. I'm not saying it couldn't happen, but I'm saying there is a lower chance mm -hmm. that I'd run into hookup culture at church than I would if, you know, I'm in a sea of people. And figuratively speaking, you are in a sea of people when it comes to online dating. Another thing that I like, because this is where I partially agree with you, where I feel like if online dating works the way that you said it does, I would agree with you. But the issue is you can put all those different filters um, but people don't necessarily adhere to them. Like, for example, when it comes mm -hmm. to religion, you can have plenty of people say that they're Christian, um, but they're not. Their idea of Christian is very differing, um, is the best way of putting it. And so and so I can actually kind of make it a little bit harder overall. Um I don't know if that makes sense or not. Does but... it though? Does it really make it that much harder if you click the Christian box, you know, amongst all the other religions or non-religious versus going to a church that's filled with people who are devout and people who are fake? You still have to sift them out there. I would say yes, you do. But I think there's a higher chance that you could find someone a little bit more serious. Now, also, too, there's also a variable that we're not thinking about because this is a hypothetical situation. The question is, what kind of church are you going to as well? Like, that's also yeah. very important. Like, if you are, um, I'm trying to think, um, I'm trying to like think of an example without, because I'm thinking of churches in my head and I can't say them out loud. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of something else. Um, let's just say you have a church that is a little bit more culturally inclined. Maybe that's the best way of putting it. A bit more culturally inclined, mm -hmm. a little bit more seeker friendly, um, you know, got the smoke machine and the lights and the, all that stuff. I'm not saying that smoke machines are an indicator of a less godly Christian. Um, but if you have all those variables combined, it's very possible that you might not have the caliber of Christian that you're looking for. Um, supposed to, if you're going to a church that, you know, they might not have the smoke machine and, you know, the, the lights and 
you know, they might not be as seeker friendly, but their theology is, you know, fairly solid. You're not going to agree with theology 100%, but, you know, it's pretty solid. You know, I think there is a higher chance that you're going to find someone of that caliber that you're looking for there um, than you would at a more seeker friendly church. Yeah. I'd be curious what uh, Christian Mingle's done to their filters to see if they've done that. Because what you've described is additional filters. All right. You start with the first filter, Christian. Mm-hmm. Great. Okay. You got that. Right. Now you could have a filter for denominations. I mean, they could make up filters for everything. You know, do you like having a light show at church? Do you like your pastor <laughs> or your, your worship leader wearing skinny jeans? You know, do you sing? Do you use instruments? Like all of that stuff could be filters. And I don't, I haven't looked at Christian Mingle in years and years I have from when I was never, interested in what they I did. have never been on Christian Mingle. I have though. I was. Farmers only? Um, no, I cannot <laughs> farm to save my life. I cannot keep a plant alive. It is the worst. I don't want to talk about it, but no, it was not farmers only. It was worse. It was called Upward, um, where I had, it was a Christian dating app. It, it sounds like a rip off Christian dating app. Oh my gosh. I went on probably the most awkward, one of the most awkward dates that I've ever been mm-hmm. on. Anyway, but that could be any app, but all that to say, though, I don't remember the filters being that great. Like, the only thing that I'd say was a pretty strong filter was what denomination, and that was about mm-hmm. it. It wasn't terribly thorough, like, asking, you know, different theological questions about how do you feel about this? How do you feel about that? Because if you did make a dating site where, you know, you go through those different questions about secondary issues, tertiary issues, you know, primary issues, you could actually match people pretty well based on those beliefs. I haven't seen that though. If I saw that, I might be interested. Um, obviously not for yeah. myself because I'm with somebody, but um, I would use Eden as a guinea pig <laughs> and <laughs> ask her to try it and see if it, and see how she liked it. Yeah, that'd be interesting. I mean, I, everything that you were describing beforehand about picking a different, you know, what type of church, it is essentially a filter. It's a naturally occurring one in your life. And now you've picked a certain pool, but consider the fact that, okay, let's say you're like, I want to, I want to find a nice, a nice Baptist. Well, how many Baptist churches can you visit? I mean, there's 52. Weeks you can visit in a year. one at a time. You can exist in one and one, you know, you can exist at one Baptist church at a time. Now you have to get to know first you have to find and then get to know all of the people who are compatible gender, age, and then you got to get into the nitty gritty, you know, details of kids and all of that stuff. So there's a lot of time that would be spent just perusing, if you will, through your potential suitors. Uh, And if you don't find one there, now you got to do it all over again in a whole nother church. And maybe it's bigger, you know, maybe, maybe, but you know, if it's smaller, you know, maybe you can, you spend less time there because there's only a couple of people and you quickly walk in and realize, nope, they're all old, about to die. (laughs) And you walk back out the door, pick a different church. Uh, That's, that's, I don't know. I know I'm not going to say that it's a good thing. I mean, it certainly kills, uh, it shortens the time process for you to be able to filter out, you know, and pick out all Baptists on a dating site, or at least the, you know, if, just being the initial filter, you get to pick, you know, it selects all of them. There shouldn't be anybody, if the, if the algorithm's working right, there shouldn't be anybody in there that didn't identify with being Baptist. So now you get to look through all of them. Then you can immediately apply the, the age range that you want. So, you know, within five minutes, you have now, you know, brought it, you know, your selection down from thousands to, to maybe hundreds in your area or just dozens. Uh, so I guess, I don't know. It, it really depends, I think, on how the individual person uses it. Um, again, it's, it's not my first choice or recommendation. And I would say that ideally the way I'm talking about it being used is not how the majority of people use it. Uh, yeah. I think I can agree with you on that for sure. It just, it just isn't. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend, I wouldn't, I agree. I would not make online dating my first choice. Um, Mm -hmm. and I'm not, I'm, I'm very hesitant to make a hard and fast rule of no online dating because I do know of couples that have met online and they've, some of them have been happily married for a very long time. Um, and some of them have just gotten married, you know, so, 
I believe that there it can be done. Um, I don't think it's a majority of people though. Um, and mm-hmm. I and I think I hear more people express their frustration with it than they do find it to be fun. And I think there's a lot of people that also spend like years on dating apps. Um, and some of them genuinely trying to find somebody and they can't find anyone. Um, so yeah. yeah, I think that's, that's an interesting thing to talk about people spending years on it. Um, because that selection is so wide, you're almost guaranteed to find somebody that is more attractive to you than the last attractive person. Like you can just keep looking. Keep expanding your church, pick a different area. And that takes, I mean, like, you don't of, have that type of time in the physical That's part of the world. issue, though. That's part of the issue, though, is that we've created this mindset of, but there could be someone else, you know, like there could mm-hmm. be someone more attractive. There could be someone who's got, you know, more compatibility points or, or, or likes this thing more. And I think, I think at the end of the day, you know, yes, find someone that, you know, you're, you're somewhat compatible with, um, find someone that shares your core values, find someone of good character. But at the end of the day, love is, is going to have to be a choice and it's a commitment because don't think that there isn't going to be temptation, you know, once you get married, you know, I, I think that's part of the, the sinful human nature that comes in. You know, I think you have to stay focused and commit yourself to that, um, as opposed to always looking, uh, for the next best option, uh, which is something that I've, I've been seeing a little bit more, um, at least in our culture and not just, I'm not talking culture as a synonym for liberal. I've seen this even, um, in, in more, uh, conservative circles as well. And I, and I don't think it's a healthy mindset to have. I'm looking for the next best yeah looking for always looking for the next best thing um mm-hmm. i don't think it's yeah, a... I, I would agree with that i mean it's like you could do that in real life but it, it you know physically doing that is a lot harder because you know uh, compared to a dating site all their interests and attributes are all just kind of listed or at least what they perceive to be their attributes mm-hmm. and right and their interests are all listed right there. So you can just kind of go through them real quick and be like, no, 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 yes, yes, no, yes. And just quickly go through them. But in real life, you got to take time getting to know those people. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, I'll, I'll add to it that like, if, if you have exhausted your, whatever your current social circles are, and there is nobody, I'm not going to come on. I'm not going to come down on you for yeah, agreed. trying to expand. No, it. Agreed. Yeah. Um, I don't, I think one of the smartest things you could probably do though for di- online dating is, you know, keep it to your area, keep it local. The ones that put you on like a national level, Um, like there's been some interviews talking about, um, I don't think it was eHarmony. I don't think they were doing it, but Tinder was definitely doing it where there's like a Tinder gold class where the most successful people on Tinder essentially get boosted to see, you know, get boosted to a larger audience. So it's like, okay, you're based out of California or something. You should only be seeing people, you know, local to you or within your state. And then it, and then it starts expanding and it's like, because you're so successful, they're going to give this most successful person the opportunity to be even more successful as they expand them to other States. It just keeps you on the app or... forever. Yeah, no. And that's exactly what it's intended to do. It's intended to keep you on the app because in the end you are the product for all of these things online, like Facebook, Instagram, dating apps, you are the product. Uh, you are not using a product. I think that is, uh, that's an incorrect way of thinking about it. They have made something to use you as a product, especially if it's free. Like right. if you're paying for it, then I would say you're probably paying for a service or a product. If it's free, then you are the product and they're selling whatever data or information they can get out of you. And the longer they can keep you on the app to keep you know, showing you ads or, or commercials or just having screen time and, and logging everything else you have on your phone, then mm-hmm. yeah, that's a great they're point. selling you, they're selling your information. Yeah. So you heard it from Connor first folks is that these dating apps don't care about you, but Connor does. So there you have it. Yeah. So if you're going to use one, find one, you have to pay for it. <laughs> yeah. Cause paywalls are, are an years. amazing thing. Paywalls are yeah. an amazing thing. It'll they keep are. a they... lot of people out. Yeah, no, it'll definitely weed out a lot of. It'll also it'll weed out your your potential matches. 
Um, and you'll also know that the dating service actually wants you to meet somebody um, and then recommend it to all your friends because it totally worked. And then they have another customer mm -hmm. uh, because love is a product that is always being sold. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I'm agreeing with you for the most part. I'm agreeing with you for the most part. And I guess we'll leave it at that. That dating, on, online dating isn't necessarily inherently evil, um, but it's definitely not our first choice. So I think we can agree with yeah, that. Certainly not. But I, I can understand people kind of getting to the end of their rope. And you think back to the old days, like, oh, you're in a little town. There's nobody for you. Or maybe there's two or three people, but you don't like them at all. Now, what's your choice? You got to you gotta uproot and move and go somewhere else. Especially if you get to like little house on the prairie days and stuff like that in America. Yeah. I do think though, again, this goes into this whole mindset of wanting the next best thing is that I think for, and I, and I don't know this for certain, so I, I could be off, but this is just my thought process is that these people that like kind of met in these small towns and stuff like that was their pool. Like to them, that mm -hmm. was enough. Um, and it doesn't mean that all those marriages turned out fantastic or that you have even a happy marriage. But what I am saying is that there was a certain level of contentment with that, where yes. we have access to everybody and information on everybody that it's so easy to be looking for something else. Um, and so yeah. I, I, I don't disagree with you though. We're like, okay, if you know, that small town, there really is nobody that's great. You know, yes, you have to up, uproot and leave. Um, but back in the day, though, a lot of communities tend to have shared values and it tended to be around religion. Um, and we mm -hmm. don't really have that anymore. Um, so the whole dating scene has flipped over on itself and it's so chaotic um, and it's so and I feel bad. Um, I feel honestly, I do feel some level of pity for myself when I was trying to date like it was so hard. Dating's hard. It's just difficult. And it's and it's trying to find someone with your values, trying to trying to get away from the hookup culture, especially if you're looking for someone serious, um, someone saying they're religious and not sure if they're actually religious. Uh, it can it can be a real headache. Oh yeah, no, for sure. I it just it it can be a real headache. I don't know if it's any more of a headache than it used to be. Um, unfortunately, neither of us can speak to that because we've grown up in an age where. It's pretty common. My, I mean, for me growing up in the, in the, as a, as a teenager, uh, less people had cell phones than for you. Um, mm -hmm. because right. we have, because that type of an age difference that we have is like, what, five years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Something, something like that. I mean, in this, in the technology age that we had growing up where, um, things accelerated so quickly, there's a huge gap, mm -hmm. uh, between the experiences. Right. And it's like, I was, as I was getting to dating age is probably when cell phones started becoming a lot more common, but it was like a 50, 50 split between I have a cell phone and me and my siblings all share a family phone. Yeah. <laughs> there was yeah. a lot of people that I knew had that. And just because you had a phone didn't mean you could text either. Right. And if you, if you, were you ever on a phone plan where uh, you had a certain amount of minutes and then like, yeah. Uh, oh, for sure. Night, nights yeah. and weekends were free. Yeah. That type of stuff. I mean, that limited yeah. a lot, uh, that limited a lot of people, yeah. but I mean, it's, it's an ever changing landscape and, you know, I think online dating is a tool and mm -hmm. it entirely depends on how it's wielded. If you are just yeah. exhausted, your options and you're looking to expand your pool of potential suitors. Great. If you are just looking for the next best thing, well, you're going to be on there for a long time. Right. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, I agree. I agree. And I, and I, we could honestly do probably like a whole another segment on how technology <laughs> has changed communications and especially with relationships and all that stuff. Um, but I think we've kind of passed our time here. Um, I guess I would just oh, yeah. we're going way past what I, I thought know. we were going to spend on this actually. Yeah. Um, but there's, I thought 45 questions. minutes. Yeah, I agree. I thought it was gonna be about 45 minutes, but we had some good conversation around it. Um, and I actually think that the stuff that we said was not too terrible overall. I think I think it was, at the very least, I think it was mediocre advice to get to consider that you wouldn't laugh it away. I think it's I think that's a fair statement. I know it's not the worst advice you can be given. <laughs> oh yeah, oh so. yeah. So that's 
But honestly, though, if um, for our audience, you know, if you like these kind of episodes, uh, make sure to let us know um, in the comments so that we can do more of those. Um, if you have questions about anything in general, you can email us at uh, residentskeptics at gmail.com, uh, or you can also direct message us. And maybe if we have enough messages at some point, we can kind of do kind of a mailbag episode to answer all of those. Um, but if you also, if you hate these episodes, then never mind. We won't do them ever again. <laughs> um, I, I think that's, I think that's just about it. Yeah, no, that is it. Yeah. I yeah. appreciate everybody that, that wrote in with questions. So they, they were fun to answer. Yeah. Yeah. Nope. They were fun. Um, everyone have a great, have a great Valentine's day. And, um, whether you're single or with somebody, um, I hope that you realize that it's just a day that they picked. It's not that important. All right. <laughs> That's all I got. <laughs> <laughs>